Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Woohoo! Christmas! Yes! Just get me something small that says I love you. Man, hey, listen, take out your worship guide because I want to jump right in. We're going to start a new message series, and I get completely stoked out of my mind when we do this. Uh, love stories. On your worship guide, there's a, there's a scripture that we're going to key in on for a little bit. And uh, we're going to look at the Christmas story, which should never get old uh, to us as believers and followers. Because it's one of the pillars of our faith. It's one of the things uh, that make us who we are as Christians, as followers and believers. And so we're going to take a little bit of a, of a look at the Christmas story starting this week. A different perspective, maybe uh, rethinking the love story, a boy, a girl, and the whole entire world. And it's going to end at Ruth Eckerd Hall all together, two services. Man, the, one, the first time, good, two people are excited. That's, ex- that's wonderful. <laughs> That's good. Hopefully you'll bring several thousand people with you. Um, It's just one of those things where we'll we'll be all together for the first time. The church is seven years old. We've never been all together. Uh, So that's what one of the one of the things we're really excited about. And the team has put together and I'm telling you, it's going to be an unbelievable service. And we're going to we're going to end the whole series um, at Ruth Eckerd Hall together. But if you notice love stories, they all have kind of like some sort of uh, like sappiness to them, don't they? Guys, you feel what I'm saying, right? It's all a little sappy and, you know, everybody's crying and sniffling and you don't care, you know what I mean? Because you're just looking at like how much popcorn we have left. This is how we know love stories impact us, right? Here's the line that we all know. You had me at hello, (laughs) right? I mean, we all like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that movie, you know. Uh, Maybe a little different this morning. Love story, a little different perspective, rethinking uh, what sort of love is happening through this this classic story um, in our minds, in our world, in the the thing that like our faith, the virgin birth, the birth of Jesus. Um, So so how do we, how do we, uh, let's look at this story and maybe we'll see a little bit of ourselves in it. And uh, the whole idea, my hope as your pastor and as a staff, we don't want this to be another Christmas. We want it to be the best Christmas. We just don't want another Christmas, another holiday. Yeah, food and family. Yeah, gift giving, friends, food and family, and then more food. But I mean, we want it to be, sure, but we want it to be the best Christmas. So, so here, here's, here's the story. Jesus was born, here we go, and what we say at the chapel, but this is going to be, be a little bit more. Lean in, because it starts right from the beginning. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Matthew is very, the author here, Matthew, he gets very specific about things. He says, during the time that King Herod was running the show, about that time some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod, however, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. I love the way the author, he immediately sets up the tension between these two, just in this one, two verses, uh, between the two people of Herod and the wise men. See, the wise men come expecting The wise men get into the whole story. The narrative starts. The wise men come. They come expecting. They come excited. There's an element of like anticipation because how you know is they brought gifts. It wasn't coming skeptical like, hmm, king of the Jews, hmm, let's see. No, they already, their journey started with an expectation. But Herod hears the same news and the author wants us to feel the tension. Herod, deeply disturbed. Herod deeply disturbed. And if immediately the the, the birth of of Jesus, this story, this classic story has so many layers. 
You, you could say, but because I know this is how it is for me, when I come into the presence of God, when I come expecting him to talk, expecting to receive, expecting to be guided, expecting to learn, I always get more than what I bargained for. But when I come into the presence waiting for him to impress me or do something, I leave empty. Right. See, and immediately what you have in the Christmas story is a perspective and a mindset. Oh, I want to come see. What would our walk, if you will, our relationship with Christ look like if we came into what we call church, and it's not a building, it's collectively all of us together. If we came collectively together knowing I'm going to hear God's voice today. I'm going to get an answer to a prayer. I'm going to get guidance. Well, immediately the Christmas story shows, look at the two different positions. The wise men, oh, I, we came to worship. Hey, by the way, where's the story? See, Herod is disturbed, but he's disturbed in more than one way. Herod's life could be the pilot episode for Jerry Springer, okay? <laughs> Herod is so absolutely dysfunctional. He's so paranoid. He was appointed by Rome to rule over the Jewish people. He was one of those rulers that got his self-worth by what he did. He accomplished more things. His nickname is Herod the Great. He accomplished more things than any other ruler in his time and any other ruler before or after his reign. Herod built more buildings and more infrastructure for the Jewish people under the Roman tyranny than any other ruler. But he was paranoid, man. He was so paranoid about losing, lean in, about losing his authority that at one point, history tells us, look it up, history tells us that his wife was caught in the marketplace criticizing the way he was ruling the kingdom. She ha he had her killed. Guys, that's not an option. All right? Just so we're clear, just so we're clear, we have evolved. All right? He's so paranoid that his sons, he sends his sons into battle. And when they come back from winning a war, he finds out from his generals that his sons did not fight the way that he taught them. He had them killed. Herod is this crazy guy. All he's into is accomplishing. All he's into is his way of life. Herod's perspective is completely different than the wise men. See, part of the reason why Herod is greatly disturbed is because this king, the birth of Jesus, what it means for Herod is up. Oh, my way of life, my authority, my kingdom, what I have built, what I have done, what I have accomplished, my comfort zone, all of it is going to now be challenged. What happens for Herod, the birth of Jesus, what happens is that all of a sudden, someone's going to move Herod's cheese. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, Herod, you, you mean this isn't my world? This isn't my kingdom? This isn't my throne? See, Herod cannot, everything about the birth of Jesus, the king, this new king, threatened Herod. Part of the problem is, and my way of life, what I've established, my values, what I like, how I like to lead, what I like to get done, what I'm comfortable with. See, Herod's in love, and it's a love story, but the problem is Herod's in love with himself. See, see, Herod's in love with what, what I, look, look what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. See, it's a different kind of love story. It, it's rethinking <laughs> some of the things that are happening around the birth of Jesus. See, Herod cannot enjoy, Herod cannot enjoy because of the same sometimes issues we have with ourselves. Herod cannot enjoy, Herod cannot look 
to worship. Herod cannot enjoy, be anticipatory to the birth of Jesus, ancient prophecy that was happening, because for Herod, he's going to lose control. See, for Herod, he's going to lose control of everything he built. He's going to lose control of everything that he's comfortable with. He's going to lose control, his authority. He's no longer going to be, he's threatened. The little world that he's built, here we go. The world that he's built, that he's comfortable with, the world that he agrees with, the world, his perspective, the world that he thinks all of a sudden has completely challenged. Listen, God will, God, with the reason why it's so hard sometimes for Jesus to birth something new in our life. Scriptures tell us that Jesus said, behold, I'm doing a new thing. The reason why God sometimes can't work in our life to birth, birth of Jesus, birth something new is because we got our hands all over it. Right. He wants to birth. We don't experience sometimes the birth of something in our families, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our businesses, because we can't get out of the way right. because it's about control. For Herod, it's about maintaining control about what he thinks and what he wants and what he's accomplished and his values and his system and his kingdom. See, he can't enjoy the birth of Jesus because the birth of Jesus means that he's going to lose control. Herod, he's just in love with himself. He's just in love with his kingdom. He's just in love with what he thinks, his thoughts. Listen, how you answer this next question will determine how much Herod we have living in our hearts. Who's in charge? Who's in charge? (laughs) Herod's disturbed because he's not going to be in charge anymore. Who's in charge? Who's in charge of my relationships? Who's in charge of my creativity? Who's in charge of how I run my business? Who's in charge of how I'm married? Who's in charge of the way I raise my kids? Who's in charge of what I click on? Who's in, cho- who's in charge? It doesn't matter. Change the content however you want. It's the question that we all have to constantly answer. And what I found personally for me, I have to answer it every day. Who's in charge? Just who's in charge? Is it my world? That's Herod's issue. My whole world's about to get blown up because of some ancient prophecy. Some king is going to be born. Uh Uh-uh. So so, is our perspective this? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. (laughs) That about covers it all. About covers it all. Just not talking about Pinellas County, Pasco. Hillsborough County is full of heathens. So I'm just saying, just saying, just. (laughs) It's so stupid. That's stupid. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world, just in case you didn't get the whole earth thing, let me go ahead and mention the world. (laughs) The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. See, when you can answer who's in charge, you can, you can begin to be joyful. When, when, you, when you can answer who's in charge, is it my kingdom or is it his kingdom, you can come with another level of expectancy. Right. See, when you establish, look, I don't like it, and I don't, I, man, it, it really stinks the way things are going here, but I'm just telling you, it's his, he's God and I am not, it's his world, not my own. I'm going to come into his house and I'm going to expect to hear from him. See, see, that's the difference. You're constantly, Herod answered that question. (laughs) Who's in charge? He said, me. He said, me, I am. And that lies the problem. And if we're not careful, listen, if we're not careful, too much of Herod will exist in our minds and our hearts to where we really can't experience what Jesus is trying to birth in us and through us. 
because we all up in it. I mean, it's hard. It's really difficult. And Herod's just saying, oh, man, I don't like this. Wise man, I got gifts. This is going to be awesome. King of, the, king of the world, savior of the world. Here, here, here's something. This idea about control isn't anything new. All the way back to the beginning, Moses leading the Jewish people. God, because it's Old Testament, God the Father is trying to teach people. I am your source. I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm in charge. I know your, that's how you know the Jewish people had a little Italian. Because they don't complain in the desert. They don't complain about the weather, the temperature, or anything. They complain about what? There's no food. There's no food. So God hears their plight and he says, okay, in the morning I'm going to provide food. So this is what I want you to do. Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of this until morning. You gather just enough for today. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. Imagine that. God saying something and someone doesn't listen. Back then, not today, back then. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. Because what God is saying back then is the same thing he's saying in the birth. It's not your world. It's mine. I'm trying to teach you. Give us this day hour daily. Oh, daily. Because if you gather more, you will go to that day and you will eat from what you do. And you will begin to think it's your world because you provided it, not me. All of a sudden... This whole control issue, see, because back then, oh, wait, here's another one. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much what God provided in the morning called manna. It says they gathered an omer, which is really a vase. It's just a measurement. An omer, a vase for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported to Moses. Like the first time they did it, it wasn't bad enough. Then he says, look, because there's a Sabbath, Gather twice as much so that the next day you can just enjoy what God has provided. <laughs> and nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Because there were people who had to have guarantees. There were people who had to have things in concrete. There were people that had to know what was coming. There were people that could not live, fully living in the faith of who he is and he's in charge and not myself. There were just people. And listen, I don't want, don't get this confused. We're not talking about not planning. We're not talking about that planning. You should plan. He gave us a brain, use it. We should set ourselves up for success in any way, relationally or financially. But the key here is in the instruction, the appetite to have concrete things and to know things and to know the outcome and to control the outcome. That appetite was greater than the obedience, and that's the problem. It was just greater than the obedience. Because he said, no, don't do this. This is a way that I'm going to teach you you're important to me, that I love you, that I'm your provider. So this idea of control is nothing new. This idea of, of wanting to know and have concrete and know the outcome. And the problem is Herod is deeply disturbed because it's messing up his world. Because he's more in love with himself than he is with what God wants to do. So that's a different kind of love story. Everything that he worked for, everything that he did, everything that he accomplished, everything that he had built, it's all threatened. And then you find him doing this. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. Why? And so was everyone in Jerusalem. See, the Jewish people thought they were going to have a king. 
that would come up as an older person out of the crowd, get on a horse with a sword of lightning and roll into Rome and start beheading everybody and let the Jews run everything. See, what happens when, what happens a lot of times, this is, this is when we're too self-consumed with us, we, we can't see God working in any other way than what we think. We, we get too consumed with us. You, you could say it like this, when things don't go our way, our joy is overcome by fear. You, you could say, our jo- you can't be joyful for someone else because we get so consumed with ourselves and our issues and our problems that I can't see. The Bible says that it wasn't just joy that people experienced, it was exceeding joy in the presence of the baby Jesus. Herod can't do that because what happens is when things don't go our way, Herod, what? This new king? Uh Uh-uh. Yeah, I can't be joyful. It turns into fear. Maybe, listen, maybe that's why when the angel appears to Mary, the emotion, the feeling that that angel addresses, he says to her, fear not. Fear not, because I know what's about to happen doesn't make sense to you, immaculate conception. I know what's about to happen is going to be scandalous when it comes to culture and society. I know that it's, it's no one's ever had this, no one's ever done this, no one's ever seen it, people are going to look at you weird. I know it doesn't make sense, but whatever you do, I know it's not this whole relationship with you and Joseph isn't exactly what you guys thought it was going to be. Don't let fear, don't let fear take away what God is trying to birth. Don't, don't, don't do it, because understand something. You will give birth to the Savior of the world. And, and when we're so consumed with ourselves about the way we think Jesus should answer a prayer, the way Jesus should do things, the way he knows, to, when we, we, can't, we can't be joyful. We can't be joyful. And this is what you have in Herod. He's so much of a controller, he's murdered to, to, to keep what he has. It's because he's so in love with himself. And what happens is, it doesn't, things don't go his way. Everybody else is excited about the birth of Jesus. Herod's like, I, I, I don't like what's going on right now. Here it is. He called a meeting of the, least, the lead priests of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. Herod all of a sudden goes, "Uh uh-uh, no, I don't like this. Watch what he starts to do. It's it's fascinating. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, hey, listen, where is the Messiah going to be born? When is this thing going to happen? The, The religious leaders would know because it's an answer to an ancient prophecy. So all of a sudden, Herod's doing a little something. It's not going his way. He can't enjoy the joy that everyone else is feeling. He can't enjoy, he can, he's skip, it's given up. His, he, listen, where's the Savior going to be? Where's this King going to be, the Messiah, answer to the world? Where's that going to be born? Well, of course, the religious leaders would know. And he said, a town called Bethlehem, six miles south of where they're located. He goes, huh. Bethlehem. Okay. Well, then, then he does this. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. What's Herod doing? Hmm. He calls for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told him, see what I got? I know where it's going to be, and now I got a time frame on when it's happening. Look at what Herod's doing. And then he says to the wise men, he told him, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Herod has no intention to worship. What Herod does is he starts gathering information. See, because Herod's losing control of the world he's built. Herod is losing control of his comfort zone. Herod is losing control of the things that mean something that he believes mean more to him than anything else, and that's all that matters is him because he's in love with himself. See, what Herod starts to do is he starts to manipulate the situation. 
Hey, so where is the Messiah going to be born? Bethlehem, huh? Hey, wise men, this is what I want you to do. Go there, fed, tell me, come back, tell me so that I can go. See, Herod starts manipulating the story. He starts manipulating the people. What does he try to do? He starts to control the people. Because this is really what happens. When you're self-consumed, when you're overly consumed with yourself, you'll manipulate situations to preserve control. And I know it's long, but I want us to get this. A lot of times what happens is Jesus wants to do miraculous things in our life, but we don't like it because we lose control and we, it's someone else calling the shots and we don't like it. And therefore, we don't ever really experience to the depth that God wants to do something. So we will manipulate things to preserve my kingdom. When, I first, when we first started getting involved in a church, I grew up Catholic, so for me, this was a cult, okay? I'd go into a church and I saw people raising their hands. I was like, either someone's under arrest or the roof is falling in. I don't quite know what's happening. And so I'd go into a church like this, and, and my wife was much more involved in the beginning than I was, and it was like, it was weird, it was, uh, and I wanted to come in late, because I didn't really get the music, and I didn't really understand what they were doing. So what I would do is I would say, why are we always late? We got to get gas in the car. I forgot to get gas. I got six days to get gas. <laughs> I got to get gas. Forgot I got to get gas. Sometimes I would purposely, because the job I had then was very sporadic hours, purposely, sometimes I'd come in even later on a Saturday night so I could sleep in as long as I could so that we would miss enough of the service to where it wouldn't just kill me because I hated church so bad. I manipulated situations to preserve what I built, what I want, my comfort zone. That's what you do. Herod. Herod. I can remember the first time you know, I grew up where we had a, like a poor box in the back. And it was when, and I'll date myself, but some of you will get this. Right? It was when the $2 bill first came out. Remember that? Nobody? Good. Well, I'm getting older. Shut up. All right, you ready? Watch. The $2 bill came out, and it made stingy people look generous. That's really what it did, okay? So we would have a poor box in the back. It was like, hey, I'm sticking a $2 bill in the box because I'm generous. $2. Two dollars. God loves my two bucks. He loves my two bucks. I'm spending 150, 200 dollars a week on clothes, but God loves my two dollars. I just want you to know. And so that's what I would do. And I remember coming and starting a personal relationship with God and learning what it meant for God to be in charge. Ready of everything of everything, and started to learn what real giving and real generosity was. <laughs> and I remember my wife would go, well, we need to write a check for this. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Listen, we got to fix the transmission in the car. Are you serious? Yeah, it's not going well. It's not going. We got to fix it. We don't have money for that. Okay. Two weeks, three weeks would roll around. She'd say, what about, are we going to write a check to the church for a No, uh -uh, no, no, no. Let me tell you what. We got to do the repairs in the house. I would just manipulate situations to preserve control, and it's Herod, right. and that's what, it is Herod, because it goes back to who's in charge. Good. This isn't. For the believer and follower, just so we're clear, this isn't mine. Nothing is mine. From the littlest thing to the biggest thing, from my wife to my kids, to the church that he's allowed us to lead. None of it's mine. Amen. And so what it does is it changes your possessive perspective. It changes your, perspe your perspective of, it's, I just take care of it. I just take care of stuff. And sometimes there's enough Herod alive in me that I miss what God is trying to do in me. Because I want to preserve control because I have forgotten who's in charge. And so what you find in a story, in the Christmas story, oh, it's love, but it's someone who's in love with himself 
and he misses the beauty of Christmas and what it means. You could say it like this, <laughs> Herod now, because he's psychotic. He crazy. When he realizes that he had been outwitted by the Magi, remember? He told the Magi, listen, go find him and come back because I want to go and worship too. <laughs> Magi don't go back to Herod. They go back a different way. They come one way, they leave another. They come one way, leave another. Don't miss next week. <laughs> what happens is they go, he's outwitted by the Magi. He was furious. Why? He can't control it. He can't control it. He was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. How you know sometimes you have too much of you, you're too consumed with you, you will gather information. Hey, where is this king supposed to be born? Bethlehem. Then he goes to the others. Hey, where, where, what time, what time? He uses the information to build up his defense from losing control. And what happens when we're too consumed with ourselves? we will use people and we will use, use things that are around us to preserve what we think, what we want, what we strive for, what we built, what we... Herod. And he goes and has all of these boys killed to preserve control. Because why? Because here's the deal. When you're in love with yourself, you're threatened by what brings others joy. When you're so consumed, when we are so consumed with ourselves, it's hard for me to rejoice with someone who's being blessed. Well, what about me? What about mine? I work hard. Boy, they must be going, doing really good. Look what they're driving. Look at the house they live in. Look at what that, look, because you're constantly thinking, me, when am I going to get mine? When am I going to get blessed? What about me? Because what happens is when we're too consumed, when there's just enough Herod in our minds, in our hearts, it's really difficult to be joyful with what God is doing in and with other people. And it prevents, oh, just, just enough Herod can prevent Someone can, can prevent Jesus, listen, from birthing something great in us. Wow. Why do they get that? They get all the breaks. Look at them, they get all the... Huh. How do we not become Herod? How do we get rid of a little bit of that Herod that may exist? How is that? Listen, it sounds simple... But I challenge you, walk it out and we'll see. Ready? Every day we give ourselves away. Yeah. Every day we give ourselves away. And this is one sure way. One sure way. You ready? You pray for someone else. Every day. Because what prayer does is detaches you from you. It just detaches because I have to think outside of myself. Hey, I'm praying for this family. I'm praying that they find. I'm praying they get healed. I'm praying that God will work in their situation. How I kill Herod in my mind and my heart, one of the ways, I just give myself away every day. I learn to pray. We learn to pray for other people. If you go to any major city, I said, what you'll find, you find it in Tampa too, but some more of, a, more of a cosmopolitan or even more of a bigger city. When you find people walking, when you find people on mass transit, buses, trains, whatever it is, what are they wearing? Okay, nobody knows. Let me ask it again. When you find, they're wearing headphones. It's because what culture is doing is going more inward. Culture is what I want. My opinion, what I think, my rights, my way. <laughs> Christianity is built on everything but that. It's about outward. It's about outward. So you have to be deliberate to keep Herod away. 
and prayer does it. It's really, really difficult for a selfish spirit to spring up in someone when they're praying for other people. God who knows the desires of our hearts. It's not that we don't pray for our family or our friends or our situations, but a lot of times when you pray for others and you're mindful of other people, what's crazy will happen, I'm telling you it'll happen. God will show up and show you that you're the actual answer to the prayer that you're praying. What do we do? We give ourselves away every day. One, by praying for other people. What do other people need? What do other people want? What, what are they desiring? This week, this past week, one of the pastors and I got together. We just sat and read some scripture together. We just, we just prayed for people that are coming at Christmas. Because someone's going to come. And someone's going to hear the life-giving words. Someone's going to hear God's voice through his life-giving words in the scripture. And it's going to change the trajectory of their life. Not because it's us, because it's God. Uh, second thing is we, we do something for someone else. And the reason why I wrote physical there, because I'm going to say this. I don't necessarily know if this is right, but send me an email, okay? Here, here's the thing. I don't know if it's necessarily giving if it doesn't cost you something. I don't know if it's necessarily giving if it doesn't call. And I say physically because sometimes we just got to get up out of our schedules. We got to get up out of our controlling ways and go do something for someone else that inconveniences us. I mean, that's it. Didn't the whole thing, didn't this whole thing following Jesus, didn't this whole thing start with this sentence? Hey, you want to come follow? Pick up your cross and deny yourself <laughs> that means you got to kill Herod every day that's how the whole thing starts I don't listen I don't care if it's opening the door at Starbucks for someone it looks like two people is rushing for the door no I get there early just to open I was at Palm Harbor Starbucks and I and it was like we were gonna convene on the door and so I sped up to open the door for this woman. She thinks I'm speeding up to beat her, okay? So I show up, I open the door, and she's walking through, like she picked it up. She's, you don't have to do that. So I kicked it, no, I just can't, I didn't kick it, no. I was just kidding, I didn't kick it. I thought it, oh, I thought it. <clears throat> just, just. Oh, really, I don't have to do it? How about this, do I need to do this? How about that? Take her out right at the knee. Just, just she walks in, open the door, and, and she goes, "You don't have to do that." And I was like, <laughs> and I went behind her. So we get in line, and I and I thought, well, I got kind of mad, but then I kind of said, "Hey, you know what? I didn't have to, but I get to." It's one of our sayings here at the church. It's one of our values here at the chapel. We don't have to. We get to. And she goes, who are you? <laughs> and I said, well, I work for Duke Energy. <laughs> and she goes, oh. We walk up to the counter, and the lady behind the barista behind the counter goes, Pastor Q! <laughs> Listen. And she looks at me and goes, and I go, <laughs> just do something for someone else. Just do something for someone else. Just open the door. Uh, there's a lot of times I'll walk on the causeway. We live at, down by Fred Howard Park. And, and uh, I'll walk on the causeway. It helps me clear my head. It's beautiful. It helps me just rest my spirit. And what, what I love is I just love being, I was like, hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just like saying hello. And what will happen a lot of times, because, you know, we know culture is weird. Culture is crazy right now. You don't know who's saying hello. You don't know why they're saying hello. You don't know. Hey, don't let evil shape God's goodness. Don't let evil shape God's goodness. You say good morning. If they want to stick their face in the concrete and not say hello, don't be mean. Don't be, talk bad about them because culture is crazy. But culture won't shape me. God's spirit shapes me. So I'll just say good morning and they go, they just put their head down. Yeah, let us not as believers and followers 
throw respect and being courteous and being honoring through the wayside because of how dirty and nasty culture is becoming. So, so the idea is just do something for someone. Why? <laughs> because Paul talking, he says this, do not forget because apparently if you have to mention forgetting, apparently there's an issue you might. Don't forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. As a believer and follower, I want to do something in the course of my day to please my Savior, to please my King, because it's His world, not mine. The third thing, we just stay mindful. We just stay mindful of blessing people with what I have. Why? <laughs> because it's answering the question, who's in charge? What? Your lawnmower? It seems trite, but listen, your lawnmower is broke. Well, I got a lawnmower. Now, you break it, you buy it. But I got a lawnmower, come get it. I'm not that good of a Christian yet to put it in my truck and bring it to you. You can come get it. <laughs> you come get it. <laughs> Why? Because it's not ours. It's not ours. Everything is God's in the earth and the world. And he created it with the borders of the sea. And so it's easy sometimes to kill Herod when you answer the question, whose world? That's what will keep us from enjoying Christmas, from being the best Christmas, is we have just enough Herod in us. We have just enough of the love for ourselves to keep Jesus at bay from birthing something new, from birthing something new about who we are, what we were created to do, what we... That's not my hope for us. That's not my hope for you, the staff, our church. It's the best Christmas. Simple, simple things that can start this afternoon. Amen? And bow your heads, let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, so much that we hear your voice through your word. And Lord, for those of us watching online or in the worship center, that you are, you're working in their hearts and their minds, Lord, because, because they're realizing we have a little too much Herod. We have a little too much love of ourselves. Lord, may, you, may your spirit break into their lives so that you can birth something tremendous so that these plans that you have for us come alive. These dreams that you've put inside of us come alive. These passions that you've placed inside of us come alive. For those of us who are listening online or in the worship center, you just need to say yes to Jesus this morning, even before Christmas, so that Christmas can be incredible, more incredible than it already is. You, you need this morning to say yes to Christ, to yes, yes to him being in charge and not you, yes to him being king and not you, yes to his authority and not yours. I want to pray for you this morning. It's very simple. We call it a prayer of commitment very very simple if that's you you repeat after me dear Heavenly Father I love you forgive me for the things that I have done and said that were not created by you and this morning I receive you as King and Lord of my life and this morning I know that you are God and I am not Today I receive your grace and I receive your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, this week teach us how to love people the way you love us and see people the way you see us. May you show us opportunity to give ourselves away. 
Amen. Amen.